You're listening to the Social Media Addicts Podcast on the phillytech.org netcast network. Sponsorship provided by AWeber at aweber.com slash phillytech. Get Flywheel, optimized WordPress hosting at getflywheel.com. Wistia.com at wistia.com. And Zoho Mail. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Social Media Addicts Podcast. I'm Seth, that's Howard, and we're missing Jody. And, and for those who are listening to the podcast, Howard just saluted. Hi. There you go. Hi. And his booming, raspy voice. There you go. I'll so, hope I, my voice makes it tonight. Uh, well, hopefully it does. You know, everyone's dealing with colds lately. So, anyhow, um, we want to you know, we want to give a plea out to everybody that if you would, like, would like to donate some money to help us you know, improve the shows and make it so that we're not goofing up left and right and whatnot and help us improve the audio quality and the video quality. Go over to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash phillytechorg, all one word, and just throw us a few bucks a month. We would really appreciate it. So, also we want to quickly thank our sponsors, wistia.com, they're our video host, hosting providers, Aweber, which is our email marketing providers, Flywheel, which is at getflywheel.com. They are our amazing web hosts. And Zoho Mail, they email, they're our email providers. Not different from Aweber, Zoho Mail is where we get our emails. So when you email h at phillytech.org or seth at phillytech.org, that's Zoho Mail. When you get emails from us, most of the time it's from Aweber. So a little, little breakage in there. So anyhow, so Howard, what do we need to know about Facebook's new Facebook feed algorithm. Well, the big thing that you need to know is that it doesn't work for small businesses. Um, a lot of a lot of the changes that they're making are uh, I don't want to say obvious pages, or obvious changes, but uh, from Facebook's standpoint, it is about making money. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is if you are a big business or a big brand, uh, the concept of a verified page, which they brought out about a year or so ago. Um, that's what's getting people more attention on Facebook, um, where the small business pages that are not verified pages aren't seeing that organic traffic. So it's sort of like, hey, small businesses, pay for your ads, but if you're the New York Times, we'll give you tons and tons of traffic because they have verified pages. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I can't get my page verified. My clients can't get their pages verified. Um, and Facebook does not have a mechanism for saying, I want to verify my page. Um, that's just something where they bless you with verification at some point or not. I've mm -hmm. seen small pages get blessed and I've seen huge pages get blessed. So whether there's some rhyme or reason to it, we don't know yet, but it would be nice if they uh, actually started rolling out those tools so that if you, they might say, look, if you're under 10,000 likes, you're not going to get verified. And maybe part of the process is, you know, if you try to buy yourself to likes and they go through the process of looking at your account, they might go, nope, you're, you're under 10,000 likes and half of your likes are purchased or offshored. Um, it'd be nice to see that verification process come through so that the algorithm could actually work for more businesses that possibly deserve some more attention. Absolutely. Um, I, I completely agree. I mean, I mean, Facebook, I mean, we've talked about this in the past. Yes, you should pay for. There is a reason to pay for traction on Facebook. I get that, but it shouldn't be slanted so much to the verified pages or to the or to the big companies that the small companies can't make it anywhere. It's not even smart for them because for Facebook because eventually everyone's just going to leave. In front well, of the next big, next big shiny object. Yeah, and the Facebook's big enough that uh, I think they kind of feel a little bit uh, like, okay, where are you going to go? And um, at this point, there aren't a lot of choices for where you would go because there's not a lot of big audiences like that. Um, some of the other changes to the uh, algorithm, one that I think matters, it's two combined. One is the uh, importance of trending topics and timeliness. So what they're looking at is if there is a story that is trending and you post about it within the first basically hour of that trend, you might get some great organic reach. But if you just try to jump on it a half a day or two days later, it's not really going to be effective. They're not going to um, bubble your content uh, or surface that content to the top. No, it'll, so, just, be, it'll just be a sad trombone. You know. Exactly. Well, and, like, and wow, my, wow. my take on this is 
if you are if your business can comment on something that is happening in a timely manner, you should absolutely do that because that's Why what not? making yeah. good content is. If it's a news story but it has nothing to do with your business, um, commenting on it it's not really going to help you because you're not going to be a good authoritative source. That's very different. Like um, for example, I take pictures. I don't shoot Nikon and I don't blog very much about taking pictures. So when Nikon introduced uh, or put out a story talking about their latest uh, 750 model that uh, is having some issues and they're doing sort of, it's not really a recall, but they're going to be replacing lots of these uh, units or having you send them in and have them serviced. For me to post about that now, it wasn't really going to help me. Um, I may have been able to jump on it, but that's very different than some of the big photo blogs. Them posting about it right as soon as that news hits, that could get some trending and that might work for them. Um, one yeah, of the other changes... Hurt, it could have hurt for you. I mean, if you have a reputation as a... As a photographer, I mean, people know Howard Yermish is a photographer of some sort, you know, even a hobbyist. That it would be somewhat, it would be somewhat, what appropriate for you to post on that. Whereas, you know, I think where it really goes from is if a mommy blogger who, who mostly blogs about baby food then comments on a comments on a um, camera, right? That, that that's more of a, I think the less time. I think you actually we might see some uptick because. You do if if you posted about Nikon's and cameras in the past at all, you might, Facebook might see that. You know what I mean? So yeah, and one of the other things that's happening, and it really comes back back to this point, is Facebook doesn't want you to do like bait. So for example, if you post a picture that has some text in it, or mm -hmm. you post something that you're trying to get some attention by posting that picture. Facebook's uh, monitoring that. So if they notice that what you're doing is you're posting lots of pictures that are simply to get likes and saying things like, you know, post a comment to this picture. Um, there's actually one of the uh, pages that I follow does a regular weekly contest that says pick a number between 1 and 1,000 and post it in the comments. And so he puts a picture up and gets literally thousands and thousands of comments on that post. That's and so all stupid. the comments are numbers. So it's the kind of thing where... Facebook's going to be trying to crack down on those kinds of things where the uh, the images don't really deserve that kind of reach or the images themselves are promotions, basically trying to get rid of um, sort of like, here's a picture that's really an ad. So they want a picture to be a picture. Um, so some of those yeah, things I mean, are... I think a lot of it's subjective, though. I mean, like what might be an ad might actually be a good ad that you want to see. Right, but here's the thing. Facebook is now detecting text in images. The same way they can find our faces, they can find text. And if they figure out that 30% of the text or 30% of the picture is text, they're going to target it. They're going to tag it as an ad. So as well, a yeah, business, well, that makes sense actually. So. Yeah. So as a business, they're trying to prevent you from doing things like putting up an ad, except posting it on your page and trying to get organic reach by doing things like you know pick a number between one and a thousand. <laughs> Number two, one in a thousand. So anyhow, talking about ads, Pinterest now has opened up its promoted pins to everyone in the U.S. market. Howard, do you use Pinterest at all? I do not really use Pinterest. I have an account. I've got some boards. I've played with it a little. Um, it's. Uh, I don't want to say I'm. I'm not the right demographic. Um, it's not generally how I organize my stuff. Um, I don't find myself going to Pinterest going, ooh, I need to plan this bathroom remodel. Let me get some put ideas up. At that said, I think that's a great way to use it. Um, whether you're a male, female, or whatever, Pinterest is oh, a great whatever. network for that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've used it you know, for things I want to remember and stuff. But I know my wife just recently got into it for different, like, planning our son's birthday parties and stuff and finding different things to keep. I exactly. Mean, there's use, uses for it, and I think you know, if you can use Pinterest and advertise on the platform successfully, it's great now that it's open to everybody. So, well, and I like the way that they're doing promoted pins because they don't look like ads, but they are clearly identified as a promoted pin. It's actually very much the same way Instagram is doing it. They're promoted, uh, basically, they're promoted Instagrams. It's a uh, you know, they're very it's very lightweight. You don't see a lot of it, and um, it's done in a subtle way, except it's not fooling you. So when you see a promoted pin, it's going to say, there's a little thing, promoted pin. Um, so you don't feel like, where did this come from? Um, and the their promoted, tweets, is, promoted tweets are the same way. They have a little promoted exactly. above it. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a subtle way. It's like, you know, I'm not yeah. trying to fool you. It, well, it's a subtle way of saying, 
if you're not paying attention, you'll see ads, and you might go, "Where is? Why is that there?" But they're trying to make sure that the ads or the pins that you see are related to the stuff that you follow. So if you're really interested in, you know, if all I do on Pinterest is pin different camera gear that looks interesting, and all of a sudden I see an ad for Old Navy, that's probably not going to be clicked on. But if I see an ad for Nikon, that would be pinned. I would do the same kinds of things. So uh, they're going to try to make sure that what they promote to individual users match with what they're already interested in. Well, I went to the Pinterest under the affiliatech.org um, account, and I see a bunch of Belgian Malinois. Because <laughs> guess who that pick is following? Is following Jody, and she's in love with Belgian Malinois. So literally, it's completely covered in Belgian Malinois and pit bulls, and now there's a cat reading a newspaper. Well, there oh, you there's go. Oh, there's a Shih Tzu. There's a Shih Tzu, too. So this, but it's mostly the dogs in my feed over there. Or if you go look at my other, my, my professional page, I'll see mostly infographics, because that's mostly what I post in, 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 in Pinterest, is I, I post infographics that I find. I post them up there to keep, so I can go back and find them at a later date. So. Got it. So let's thank our first sponsor. Today's sponsor is, today's show is sponsored by Wistia. Wistia is a video hosting and analytics platform that helps businesses get the most out of online video. We use them here at Philly Tech, and because it's it's way more professional than YouTube, and the data that Wistia provides helps us understand exactly how our content is being consumed. Best of all, Wistia has a ton of free resources on their site to help those who of us who are just getting started with video, sort of like us. <laughs> now, we're a little bit better than that, but you know, Wistia's resources are really great. So check them out at wistia.com. That's W-I-S-T-I-A.com. That's W-I-S-T-I-A.com. And tell them that we sent you. So, Howard, you there? I am here. You are there. Sorry, he was drinking, he was drinking a beer. No. Well, yes. Mountain Dew. Trying to stay awake, right? Close enough. So, everyone's getting on the video bandwagon. You know, we, our last sponsor was Wistia. Well, now, apparently, coming soon to Twitter is video hosting. They're going to host the videos directly on Twitter. Well, given what Twitter has been doing with uh, trying to rein in third-party services so that more people are using twi the Twitter experience directly, I can only assume that what is to follow is auto-playing videos in the Twitter feed and oh, only okay. auto-playing videos that are hosted on Twitter. So... Uh, right now, if you post a link to a YouTube video, you see a preview for that YouTube video. Well, they're yeah, basically nice. giving that traffic away to YouTube, and that's Google. That's not Twitter. So in order to get more people to just be on Twitter, go post your short videos up to 10 minutes on Twitter. Short uh, videos up Twitter to 10 host minutes. It. Did you just hear yourself? Short videos up to 10 minutes. I still think this a short is, video is up to 10 minutes. This is the 140 character. Seconds. Yeah, this is the 140 character service. Well, I and think what they realize... Minutes is the tweet can still be short, but the video can be an experience. And if they can advertise and promote those things, then why not? So It is kind of intriguing if you think about it, what you could do with Twitter once you can do video. So let's say you post a tweet, you know, you know, 140 characters saying, you know, the State of the Union, I don't agree with Barack Obama, or I agree with Barack Obama, and here's why, dot, 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 and up comes the video. And you yeah. can just upon your thought. I was actually thinking about it... You, um, think about what Tumblr does, where Tumblr is this sort of microblogging service where you can have a, an image or a video or a quote and things like that. Um, with video in line, with Twitter sort of controlling that experience, a microblog like Tumblr, I don't want to say becomes irrelevant, it's just that you can do more with Twitter. It can really be your publishing platform. You know, here are my few, if you're a video blogger, you can use Twitter as your, as your entire platform. So. Yeah. More uses for lists. Exactly. There's no way in the heck I wanted to see this in my timeline. I'll make a list of video bloggers on Twitter. Put them yep. in a video blogging list and sit, spend a day one day and look through all of them. So check, definitely check it out. Um, here's It's kind of interesting. I actually first heard about this on 15sectech.com, which is Amber MacArthur's new yep. adventure. Yeah, and, and it was a former based, pick of the week. Exactly. And it is based on the 15-second videos on Instagram. And they're talking about... So it's episode 44 of 15 Sec Tech. Yep. Well, so, I'm, I'm really curious. I would love to see... Uh, I look at it this way. If you're a publisher of content, if you make content, 
having video directly on Twitter can't be bad for you. It can just be another way to figure out if your audience is there. You might have an audience that loves Twitter and doesn't really like YouTube. And if that works, that works. Go for it. I'd like to see the features that they, they, they put it in with the video. If they're going to add filters or they're going to add this or that, if they're going to add playlists. I mean, I'm just kidding. I mean, they could go completely hog wild with this and completely go off, jump the shark as, as well. So. Well, if you think about Instagram and some of the apps that they've done uh, for video, they have the Hyperlapse app. Um, well, why can't Twitter do something similar? You know, it's a microblogging app, something that makes it easy for you to create the video, automatically post it, add some titles, do all the things to, to uh, possibly get stats out of it as well. Uh, it could be a good thing. Yeah. Well, it's something completely different. I don't have a segue for this. And now for something completely different. Exactly. Was it my Python? Yes. Okay, good. Let's make sure. It might, it's more your generation than mine. What? Am I calling you old? You are. That's fine. Life is rough. I'm calling you well-aged. Well-aged Mountain Dew. Oh. Um, there you go. Hey, by the way, have you seen the new Mountain Dew? Um, half cane sugar and um, half stevia. Is it the old Mountain Dew logo on it? I have not seen that yet. It's pretty wild. They have all these retro cans out. They're following in the footsteps of Miller. Miller has the old retro cans. Oh, Hi. well, there you go. Tangent. Squirrel! Anyhow, that guy... Courts, are, courts in America are really ill-equipped to, to, to police cyber threats and cyber bullying in the, in the anonymous age. This is on, over on TechCrunch. Uh, the, what the article is talking about is these services like Yik Yak, and, which I've never heard of before, but Whisper and Secret, where people can post things up there that are, you know, say, like, you know, I have four fingers, I'm missing a finger, or stuff that's worse, and then they, in essence, get bullied. And because it, it, it's anonymous... You know, these bullies can get away with it, and the courts can't really crack down on them. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, don't post something on these services that you don't want to hear what people have to say about it, but also, people, be nice. Yeah, and one of the things that's a challenge with these anonymous services is um, people are posting threats using the service. So they're actually using these anonymous services, and now... The courts are saying things like, well, we need to get an IP address or we need to get some of this information. And unfortunately, because of all the privacy that that service affords them, the courts, which don't really know how to run down that path, they don't know how to go through it, they go to the ISP, the ISP says, well, it doesn't matter, there was no, like, we don't have an IP address to give you, or you're asking for the wrong thing, it's like you... Um, and they're like, what the heck? Like, we just want to find out who did this, did this threat. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, there's lots of things. Uh, this year, there's going to be a lot of uh, court cases, legislation, new laws, petitions, all about this issue. The, and mm -hmm. it's not so much that it's cyberbullying, but it's, I want my information to be private. I want that ability to say, look, this is my, I want to keep things private to myself, but my government wants to be able to protect me, and I want them to be able to protect me. So the same mm -hmm. scream of me saying, I want to be able to encrypt my data, I want the uh, government to be able what? to decrypt the data of the person who is the cyberbully. Well, what's the service, difference? Service segue into something that's right. not on the show notes, but David Cameron, the, the Prime Minister of England, wants back doors installed or... Or yep. all encryption destroyed before coming to Great Britain. Yep. Um, don't get me started on that. Yeah, it's a. Uh, Are you kidding me? Like, because yeah. now you're just giving backdoors to all the criminals, and by not letting encryption happen, I. Uh, I so yeah, I and I, it's I like, think the, um, I I think the, the one of the issues with this is um, if uh, if encryption I don't want to say was necessarily re-engineered, but if we looked at how encryption was done, and what laws could compel, basically could say, you if you have encrypted information and a warrant is gotten, then the same way someone could uh, do a search of your house if they have probable cause, they might be able to say, if you do not provide decryption keys for law enforcement, then, you know, there may be, for lack of a better term, there may be some issue with... Uh, like it, the same way you, uh, you you might be effectively pleading the fifth to say I'm exactly. not going to give you my decryption keys because that will incriminate me. Well, okay. Well, that is when someone pleads the fifth, a jury says, well, 
they're not answering these questions, so are they guilty or not, but they're not going to incriminate themselves that way. Um, we kind of need to get through this issue as a, uh, as a culture because Absolutely. otherwise we're going to be stuck trying to keep up with technology that's going to go way faster than the laws are going to go. And that's normal. Um, it's not unexpected. It's just that I think the laws need to start catching up a little bit. Um, a little I don't fast, like less the, bureaucracy. Well, I feel like the laws right now are really stuck in the late 80s, barely cracking the age of the Internet. Um, I see things like, oh, well, for this court case, we got access to all of these email messages. Well, all of those email messages, what does that look like? Absolutely. Email messages. People do things yeah. via instant messenger now and they get so much different so different. So So what's next on the docket? The next on the docket is a sponsor break. Yay. <laughs> Flywheel is our marriage hosting provider. They're awesome. We use them for, I use them for so many different clients' websites. Um, they're a hosting platform built specifically for designers and creative agencies. Flywheel makes it simple to build, launch, and ma manage client sites with ease with an easy-to-use dashboard built from the ground up for the modern web designer. They have nightly backups, which is awesome, blazing fast load, load times, and WordPress-specific security, which is, you know, we're talking about security here. You have to have your WordPress sites backed up and up to, up to date, so they help you out with that. So check them out at getflywheel.com. We thank them for being sponsors of our podcast. We thank them for hosting our website. You know, they're awesome. I use them all the time. They are an incredible company. Check them out at getflywheel.com. So apparently Facebook and Yelp are losing the support of small businesses as well. We kind of alluded this to this a little bit above, but um, Yelp's pay-per-click is way out of reach for, in price range of anything that a small business can afford. I mean, it's incredible how much it's charged for an ad. But yeah, you know, it's funny because I think for certain, like if you're a restaurant, $300 a month ad isn't ridiculous, except that's just one of the many places that you have to advertise. So there's yeah. always that, well, it costs us $300 a month, but we're not seeing the kind of uh, return from it. We're not seeing the number of visitors. We're not seeing our promotions done properly, uh, or not so much done properly. We're just not seeing a result from those promotions. Then, you know, maybe Yelp just isn't delivering what they're charging for the ad. Or, you know, maybe it's delivering fine and, you know, businesses are just being cheap about it because they feel like that they're giving $300 to Google, to Facebook, to Yelp, to more and more places. Next thing you know, all of their online spending is two, $3,000 and they say, I can't, I just can't do that. I got Pinterest to, to spend money on. Exactly. And you have to add one more in there. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, and when you look at it, this is actually a nice boon to Google because boo, boo, I think that's the right word because Google can actually you know it's like look we're actually the least expensive way of monetizing it and we're the biggest search engine in the world yep. so why don't you come to, why don't you come use us and advertise here and so even you know even Facebook ads relatively inexpensive you say to a restaurant hey throw twenty bucks for a couple of days at this ad and they get some result they might do that four or five times a month spend a hundred bucks you know a third of what they would spend on Yelp and probably get a similar result. Yeah, and I actually find Yelp less helpful lately. I feel like, I, I don't know, I just feel like Yelp is, Yelp is throwing itself under the bus here. I mean, Facebook ads are much cheaper than Yelp, but the conversion is low, and that's the problem. A lot of times people won't convert through Facebook ads. They'll see it, they'll like it. They like it, that's a click. It's costing you money, but they're not necessarily going through and doing more actions on that, so... Well, and also think of the experience. If you're on Facebook and you go to a movie, it's really easy. Like when you're posting a status update, it knows you're at the movies. So yes. you say what movie you're seeing. It's the same thing with a check-in at a restaurant. Well, if you go to Yelp to share socially that you are using Yelp, it's a many-step process because people don't hang out on Yelp. They go to Yelp because they're about to go to a restaurant or they just went to a restaurant. Not most just like, oh, it's Tuesday afternoon, let me hang out on Yelp. And most of the time, so, they're bad, most of the time it's a bad experience that they're on Yelp. You know, that they're well, if they go back after, like, if, they, if I go to a sushi place and it's wonderful, then I might review them if I remember, oh, I went to the sushi place, I should review them. If they were terrible, I'm at the restaurant saying, this place is awful. So On Yelp, yes. On Yelp. So I look at it this way. If Yelp was a place for people to hang out, 
then they would see more uh, traffic from the content that gets produced for them. Because remember, Yelp doesn't really make content. They wait for us to feed it. And, yes, you know, I'm not fe- I look at it this way. For the number of places that I go to eat, I don't feed Yelp as much as I should, and I say should in the largest air quotes that I can. <laughs> um, but uh, I very easily feed Facebook you know, my content without even thinking about it. It's just very simple to do. Mm-hmm. It's also rewarding. There's plenty there for me to look at. Um, I, I almost look at it this way. I've started using um, something like Urban Spoon a lot more because I'm finding that I don't get any real friend benefit out of using Yelp and Urban Spoon has just as good information and it's got a randomization factor where it's like, well, show me a Chinese restaurant in four miles that's got two dollar signs to it. Where do we go? And exactly. they give me an idea. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Honestly, I feel like this, you know, on the internet, it's it, you have to spend money to make money, ultimately. And when you think about where you're going to spend your money, Facebook maybe, out of the two of them, Facebook and, and Yelp, it really depends on what you're going to get out of it. Facebook, in my opinion, those conversions are low. Those conversions you get, you're probably going to get more conversions there than you are going to get through the $300 Yelp app. Because people, like you said, Howard, people are not using Yelp throughout the day, whereas I'm on Facebook all day. Not by choice, because I have to be on there. But, you know, I'm on Facebook. I'm chatting with people. I'm looking at stuff. I'm, I'm participating in groups and whatnot. I'm on there. So if I see an ad that I want to like or get a deal on, I'm more apt to go there and, and interact with it than on Yelp. Same thing with Google Ads. I'm on Google. How many times do you Google a day? Seriously, oh, how many times do you get Google? Constant. You know, it could be 20, 30 times a day I've used Google for search. And that would be every a... Every time I out of my office. I said the word Google and everything just went, yes. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I Google just now. Like, it's, it's, right. it's not constant. And, I mean, so if you think about where people are going to be constantly be, constantly be, I mean, even see Twitter ads are a place to be because there's a lot of big people on Twitter that are doing multiple different things. It's not a one-use Yeah. Site. Well, and, and I always look at it this way. If you can create a, uh, an ecosystem where people go there, and, I, and go there is probably the best way to think about it. People go to Facebook. They hang out there. It's a constantly open tab. Um, yes. Same thing with Google. Same thing with their Gmail. Um, same thing with Twitter. These are things that are constantly open. Yelp is not constantly open. Yelp is a, oh, I'm going to this city and I think I need something. Or is there a business that's kind of like this? Um, The funny thing is I've never really seen businesses other than uh, restaurants or some small local shops do anything substantial with Yelp. No, I'm on there because I have to be on there. Right, but yet there are lots of businesses that are listed, but there's no reviews, there's no traffic, there's very little information. They're just there. So it's like, oh, well, I'm trying to find, uh, you know, I'm trying to find a computer repair service in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Okay, well, there's not really a lot of great places or a lot of great reviews. You Google it. You Google it. And and the funny thing is if you Google it, you get great results. You get great results from Google and mediocre results from Yelp. And for $300, if someone said, hey, I got $600 to spend, should I spend it on Google Ads or Yelp, I would say... Spend it on Google Ads, and if you have extra, then maybe do some Yelp work. Exactly. So what's, what's our next story, Howard? Our next story is, well, this is one that um, I don't want to say I'm surprised, but it is Google Glass getting retired. And it's not really getting retired. It is, it is no it's longer... It's evolving. So the original Google Glass was this Explorer program. So for the low price of $1,500, you too <laughs> could wear a piece of uh, basically beta, if not even alpha, technology. Mm-hmm. Very bad battery life. Um, you know, you could only really use it for four or five hours between charges. Um, also something where very limited app support, uh, certain things that you could do that were pretty neat, but... Uh, from a society standpoint, lots of problems, lots of issues with people, you know, knowing what is on your face. Like, what is this thing? Um, not yeah, really, really a seamless what is experience. Yeah, thrown off of them and stuff. Really, like, you know, yep. it, it was a lot creepier. It was a creep factor to it. So technically what Google is doing is they are moving the Google Glass product into the same, uh, basically under the same uh 
care that uh, they've done with Nest, which is Tony Fidel, which is he's a, Tony Fidel is a products guy. His original mm -hmm. products was with the iPod and the iPhone. He knows how to make products. So I think ultimately for Glass, the, he it's in the right place for them. It's no longer for sale. My guess is we're going to see not this summer, but a year from this, basically a year from now, we'll start seeing what that product turns into. So I'm thinking Google I.O. of not 2015, but Google I.O. of 2016, we will see the launch of the next iteration of Glass. And it'll I probably... Think be. Be. I don't think there will be another Glass. I think it's all wearables, but it's all like wearables yeah. that are... Well, I think we're going to see something really interesting with that. And um, I don't know what it looks like yet, Again, if I knew what it looked like, I'd be Tony Fidel. I think that they have some ideas for it, and I think that those ideas are substantive. I think we are going to see something that people are going to look at it and go, that is the evolution of Google Glass. I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to look like Google Glass. I think it's going to it's going to win on certain things like battery life. I think it's going yeah. to win on, um, for lack of a better term, I, I like the idea of a wearable, but I like it. I think it's going to be thought through in terms of how it fits in with society. So mm -hmm. yeah, the concept the of, yeah, well, the, I always look at it this way. The concept of a camera that's always on, do you need that for that product to be interesting? And the answer is maybe you do, but we're just not ready for it as a society. So maybe the answer is we have something that says your camera and Google Glass, the camera is from your phone, that the phone and, and wearable uh, application, the I'll call it the little heads-up display that you would get, you decouple the camera from it, and you really treat it as this is a extension of a mobile phone and not a camera for the phone. Or There's contacts some things, or something that people don't or know. Contacts. Or contacts. Yeah, there, I, I just get the sense that they're going to do something pretty special. Um, and I'm really interested to see what that is. I hope it is not $1,500. I hope I it's something like $300. And I hope it's something that people don't feel like, oh, creepy, they're, they're going to have to work through these issues, and I think they're going to really think it through before they bring anything to market. Um, that's Tony Fidel's way that he's done things. Mm -hmm. So he likes simple products. Google Glass is going to get very simple and very specific, and I think he's going to solve that problem that we have that we don't know that we have. I mean, Absolutely. the problem he solved with the iPod, this is my favorite thing, the problem that the iPod solved was I couldn't fit 10,000 songs in my pocket. Well, I didn't know I had that problem until he came out with the iPod. <laughs> So, <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, that's not a problem. I was walking around going, damn, these CDs won't fit in my pocket. I didn't buy big pants so I could carry around 100 CDs. Oh, so yeah. I think he's going to do that same kind of magic of what is the problem that we can solve so that we can describe it that way as opposed to, hey, look, we got a camera on our face and it records video and we can like have a heads-up display. Um, I look at it this way. That's disjointed, yeah. Well, Google Glass... When they originally launched it, and it was they were diving out, they were parachuting, you know, basically wearing glass and streaming the video from Google Glass while they're parachuting. I look at it and go, yeah, this is a product where everyone looked at it and went, wow, that's really cool. Um, and why would you wear that for anything else? So yeah, I mean, it has its use cases. I mean, a lot of parents that had it, you know, a lot of you know, the, like the first people. Like the, like the techies that had it, with their parents love it because they can be they can be involved with their kid. And say, take a photo right now, and the kid's smiling, and we get that photo. Yep, they don't have to get their phone out. They don't have to get those things out. Oh, yeah, I, I heard that. Would make, from a kid right now, he's two. Trying to get him to smile, and then wait for my phone to actually click. You forget it. Right. Well, and, and, and it's interesting camera. because I think that uh, that is solved by a phone that has a really easy, quick unlock directly to the camera app. So well, actually, yeah. the Motorola X has that. Exactly. But it lags. Well, you can get it the lags camera, but then it lags. <laughs> right. Um, but I look at it this way. For Google Glass, if you had them on and now your baby's doing something, you have to do something. It's very subtle. You know, you might only have to do a quick thing like that. But look, if you're a parent and your goal is to capture footage of your kid, you're just going to have your camera on with the phone ready to go. It's just going to be like, I need to take video all the time. Yeah, I walk so, around my SLR all the time. I'm like, when I want a video of a lawn, I'm like, yeah, there you go. Yeah. He's always, luckily, he's always doing something cute. So always well, that's what babies do. So, yeah, or toddlers in this case. So anyhow, let's take our third sponsor, Aweber. Third sponsor, yeah. Aweber is a local to Philadelphia region. It's been in business for 16 years. Um, Aweber has, has helped entrepreneurs, agencies, and small businesses connect with their customers through email marketing. 
So check them out over at aweber.com slash tech and find out more about how you can get your first month for just $1. Um, they are based in the Philadelphia area, so they're local to us, and they are a great company. Uh, and it was really great interface and wonderful way of interacting with your audience. So check them out today. Go to aweber.com slash phillytech and tell them we sent you. So Howard, Wavelengths yes. want to make want to make sharing digital movies as easy as sh sharing physical DVDs. Explain All right, so this. I will explain this. Remember Please. when we had um, those boxes for DVDs and we could like give them to a friend and that was like yes. cool. Hey, I just watched this movie or I own this movie. I want you to see it. So here, here's a box with the like right there. Well, Social media. Right. It's like could we do that here? Here's a thing. Well. In the digital age, how do I do the same thing? Well, this is interesting because I can't loan you a downloaded movie. In order for me to loan you a copy of a movie that I downloaded, I have to effectively pirate it, break some kind of encryption uh, or copy protection. So You're making a copy at that point. Cause you're still and you're making a copy. copy. So, yeah, I own that copy, and I could certainly, like, bring my phone over to your house and stream the movie onto your machine or something. Like, there's ways that you can do it, but they're not graceful. It's not as simple as, hey, here's the copy of this thing that I bought. Watch it, and when you're done, you give it back to me. Well, they figured out that in ultraviolet, which is a, uh, a digital media way of copy protecting movies, ultraviolet has a, I can share a copy with this, to a friend. So it's sort of like giving them the ability to watch it and mm -hmm. then unshare that. So you can't just give it out to everybody, but I can control that sharing. So here's what Wavelength did. I don't know what you own. So it's kind of like because I'm going to integrate all the stuff that I own and make my own little bookshelf, you can look through who all, well, theoretically all of your friends' bookshelves at once to say, I want to see this movie. Oh, Howard's the one who owns it, so I will borrow it from Howard because he's not watching it right now. So it's kind of a way to... Well, that's uh, intriguing. It, well, it's, it's kind of like crowdsourcing copy protection. It says the, the services allow this thing, and if I knew you owned this video, I'd borrow it from you because you bought it, and you could loan it to me for a day or for a week or whatever it is. And I'm really curious to see how this works, because you know the movie studios are going, no, 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 we do not want this. No, 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 we, that is not what it is for. Um, but I have a feeling that other services like this, where the what's allowed from a sharing standpoint, they will crowdsource it. They'll figure out a way to get that data distributed. That's what Wavelength does. you got to log in with Facebook because the magic happens where it's like, we know this is your library, and these are your friends, so your friends can now see your library, and we're going to just aggregate all these libraries together to make content that's available. It's interesting usage for the Facebook graph. Very interesting. Yeah. So now, to the next story, which I'm not prepared for. How would you spend <laughs> 30 minutes in social media? Howard, this is not one of your stories you have to explain. All right. Well, 30 minutes on social media. I get, uh, I get asked about this all the time. People will say to me, I need to manage my social media. I don't have enough time. What should I do? So theoretically, you should be doing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we don't have time for that. So there's this great little article that I found that was really just about what are the things that you should do to manage your social media. It broke it down into some very distinct responsibilities. Um, curating, crafting content, posting content, scheduling content, measuring the performance of what you're doing, analyzing some of those stats, uh, as well as responding and listening and engaging, as well as providing help. Uh, planning what you're going to do in the future, and making some experimentations. These are all some really good things to do. But if you only have 30 minutes, you have to kind of, you, you can't do all of those things. You have to pick and choose. So you might look at it to say, if I've only got 30 minutes, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I'm listening and responding. That's kind of, you know, at a very base mechanism. You want to make sure that if someone's upset or they love you, you acknowledge it and respond to it in a great way. Um, otherwise, you know, you're, for lack of a better term, you're asleep at the wheel. Now, if you can also create some new content and make sure that that gets posted, well, that's great. 
if you can also repost some content, some older content, something that says, well, I wrote about this six months ago and it's relevant just as much now. Let's get that out there. Coming up with an effective strategy for that is really difficult. And if you don't, you will find yourself spending hours and hours and hours. Um, and I just thought this was an interesting thing to look at. You know, what are those activities? If I can only have 30 minutes, I got to make sure I'm doing a little bit of these things. You know, one day I'm going to focus on curating things. Another day I'm going to focus on scheduling some content. Um, but you're not just wandering for 30 minutes. Absolutely. It's a great article. And I mean, there's a great point that, you know, if you do certain tasks just a little bit, you'll be able to really grow your social media following and not have to live on it, which is great. Um, finally, the final story of this night before we got into our last sponsor, our picks, um, is not all cops are bad. This one likes to dance in the car to Taylor Swift. All right. Yeah, so obviously this is something we have to show, but what's not? Yep. Well, the video, uh, here's the thing about this video. It is a lip sync of a Taylor Swift song, and it is done by a police officer. In Dover, what's, Delaware. What's great about this video, and I have to say, this is one. This is the reason I love this video so much, is the police officer is driving around on, he's at work. He is basically looking. On duty. For, he is on duty, and as he's on duty, you see him get really into the video. And as he's getting pauses in, as he drives by stop signs and knocks yes, people. He as he's looking off. at people and people like waves him, he's like, "Hey, how you doing?" And then he waits till they're kind of out of sight, and then he gets yeah. right back into it. And so there, you can't hear it. We won't be able to hear it because I don't have it piped in. But exactly, but he's, as, getting, he's getting started. Exactly, he's as he's going, um, as he's going, and you see him lip sync. He's, he's just, beautiful. he's really, really into it, and you'll just, he'll get to certain points. And he'll just stop, like, uh oh, someone's watching me. So here I, you know, I'm the normal cop, whatever. And then, you know, five seconds later, he is right back into it. Um, yeah, and look, he's getting back into it. He's he's, getting, he's shaking his shoulders a little bit. Yep. Oh, the best part is coming up right here. He's looking around, making sure no one sees him. And then he stops at a stop sign. Wait for it. Wait for it. He's getting really into it right now. Yep. And this part is Taylor Swift is this big burly cop, this big burly bald cop, and he's shaking his, he's getting all into it, and he stops and he nods and someone like you know I'm cool, I'm a cop, you know. <laughs> oh God! Yeah, I, when you get to the hand motions, it's pretty great. Um, so there's so, so much traction of the wheel. You know what the thing that this reminds me of, and um, I, I look at it this way: the original Numa Numa video, the yeah. kind of lip syncing that that kid was doing was so just free. He was very much like, I am just expressing myself. I'm loving it. This guy has the exact same look on his face when he's really into it. He's committed to it. It's not that he doesn't realize that he's being videoed with the dashboard camera. Oh, I think he, I think he forgets. I think he's just sort of like... Well, it's, just, it's on all the time. They're constantly being monitored for these things. So he's just like, look, I'm constantly being monitored. Who cares? So, yeah, he, obviously he gets really into it. He starts you know, spelting it out. Yeah, my guess is there are hundreds of videos of him lip syncing to songs, all kinds of songs, and this just happened to be a really funny one that they pulled out. And honestly, you know, he probably looks at it and is like, "Oh my God, it's sure post it, whatever, you know, do your thing, you know." If it helps out, if it helps out, you know, the, the image of the police. I mean, yeah. I miss some police officers. My, my brother-in-law is a is a police officer. I can see him getting down to like, you know. One direction in the car and stuff like that. Exactly, but here we go. It's 2015. We got our first viral video. It's all over the place. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I'll uh, go see it now. Go see it now. It's it's um it's a, it's a Taylor Swift cop. It's awesome. All right, so finally, our last sponsor of the of the evening is Zoho Mail. They're a professional email for your business. They provide professional the professional email built for and designed for business. They are low cost and professional email with business class features and security. I really brutalized that. Go check that. Go check it out. All right, picks of the week. It's picks late. Of the week. All right, you it's get to late. go first this week. I get to go first this week because we're missing Jody. Tear. Exactly. Put her in the state of the union address or something like that. So yeah, many people remember Falcon. It started out as a as a little Twitter widget for Android. And it then blossomed into this great, you know, awesome Twitter app for like, you know, basically looking at your Twitter streams and customize. Twitter cracked down. You can't really use that old Falcon without kind of doing a hack around it using your own key. So Falcon 3 came out again. And, and 
And the, the developer actually found out a good way of doing it and a good way to make some money on it as well. Because before you paid 99 cents or 3 bucks or something like that, some one-time fee, and that was it. Falcon Pro is, it gives you a demo account for free. You can install your own account. You can look at some lists and see the basic functionality. The first account is three ninety nine, so it's four bucks. And then each additional account you want on there, because most people are going to be at three ninety nine. That's all they have. I have two or three accounts. So I'll pay. I, it also keeps me down. It keeps it's it's manageable. The tokens are manageable. It's the only a certain amount of tokens to you to give out to people. So people are like, well, I only need one account in there. So I bought one account, the first account, and I bought another one for one ninety nine. So I have two accounts: the Philly Tech underscore org account and I have the Seth Goldstein account. In Falcon Pro, I we will do a screencast for it for the the Intergalactic Mobile OS podcast that Howard and I are going to start doing eventually. Yep. And um, I'm going to do a screencast as one of the picks, and you guys can see the functionality. It's very slick. It's all material design. It's it's awesome. It's incredible. So you have to check it out. Like I said, it's three ninety nine for the first account, and it's a buck ninety nine for every additional account beyond that. So if you want, if you have fifteen accounts, it's a lot of money. But if you need it, go for it. Howard, what do you what do you got for us? My pick this week <clears throat> is aside nice. from a throat lozenge. Um, my pick this week is actually a tool I've used it for years, and I've never really thought about uh, not so much not sharing it, but it's just one of those things that I kind of make sure I have with every browser that I use. Um, I use Google Apps, and my Apps account is uh, it basically is Gmail. So I use a tool called Boomerang, and Boomerang has Boomerang for Gmail, and it also has Boomerang for Outlook. So it, you can use it. Two different pieces of software. The Gmail application, it is it comes in free as well as personal and pro. But think about it this way. If you ever had an email message that you wanted to send tomorrow morning or send two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I make an appointment with a client and they're going to come to my office, I send them a confirmation, typically a day beforehand. Well, that confirmation is going to say, uh, looking forward to meet tomorrow. We're going to meet tomorrow at 2 o'clock, and here's directions to my office. Well, why do I need to wait until the day before to send that confirmation? I can send that confirmation today. It's just it'll get to them on a scheduled time. So it allows me to send a message in the future, and that message can be scheduled for a particular time. What it also does is if there's a message that I've received in the future, in, like it's in my inbox, and I say, you know what? I, we've been replying back and forth, but I want to touch base on this in two weeks. So, <clears throat> excuse mm, me. Let, let me let me have this come back into my inbox two weeks from now. So you can do things like have a message return as a new message. Do so it's, sort of like, it's sort of sort of like inbox by by Google. Yep. It well, oh, it's a, it's a, it's actually a lot. Uh, there's a lot more features with it. Um, everything from you can, for example, if uh, I can send a message and it'll come back to me if nobody replies to it. So, like, if no one replies to it in three days, that message comes back to say, "Wait, no one replied. Let's follow up on this." So, you can do some very, very cool things. Um, you can also uh, there's different notes you can add, uh, mobile access for the for one of the paid accounts. Um, Google Apps requires. Uh, the fifteen dollar a month access. Uh, oh, really? So there's also recurring messages. There's all kinds of different things that you can do, but it's a very very cool uh, service that you can do. The free account gives you ten a month to play with, so ten messages that you can schedule in the future. I but use it like that. But with apps, you have to pay for it. You only get the ten. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Well, with you can use the free with apps, but it's only ten a month, and that's it's barely enough to do anything. Um, once you start using it, I mean, I, I use it many times a day. Uh, I send a message to someone that I I have boomeranged for two days from now. You know, I send someone a proposal to do a project. I boomerang it as if they don't respond within two days. I want to say, hey, did you get this? Or do I have the right to check the email message? You know, mm -hmm. check to make sure I didn't screw something up. That is very cool. I'm going to check it out. I just installed it on my apps account, and I'm going to play with it. Um, and it does have a trial, so... Definitely give it a shot. You can try it out. Awesome, guys. Well, this has been another wonderful edition of the Social Media Addicts podcast. Please check in with us next week as we enlighten you with more interesting news and topics and picks from the world of social media. Also, be sure to tune in to the other shows on fullytech.org. Um, we have a bunch of other shows coming out, one, one that's on autism technology, 
Um, and then we're in the Intergalactic Mobile OS podcast, which Howard and I are going to get started on. In development. In development. We're going to start working on that hopefully this week or next week. And we'll have a beta episode up soon, hopefully. And maybe once in Howard's voice, he sounds less like the Godfather. And we'll get that going. And there's a bunch of other shows coming out there as well. So take care, guys. All right. Good night. Take care.